What an honor to be on stage with all of you. Thank you very much for making the journey down here to Florida. I hope your stay is good. And we're very excited to have this conversation with you. For folks obviously watching, listening, uh, you'll get an opportunity to ask questions. And I'll tell you later about that. But I, as you hear this conversation, hopefully you'll be thinking about questions. You can either go to the mic or if you want, you can text your question if you don't feel like going to the mic or, or want to remain anonymous or whatever. But we're happy to have your questions and we will get to that. In, in a little bit. But let's start with just getting to know just a little bit about our panelists. Uh, we'll start with you because uh, they know a lot about you, most folks here. Uh, but I thought it'd be interesting first, uh, as you talk about your role, as I said last night, he's now in the show. He moved up to the major leagues at AFT. <laughs> uh, but your role uh, at AFT, how it's been there. And, uh, but before that, I'm going to ask everybody their first job ever, because you're all now at the top. You're the president, you're the leader of the organization, you're organizing people, but what was your, when you were a young man, Fed, what was your first job ever? And then let's talk about your, your experience at AFT so far. Oh my goodness, my first job. Uh, my first job was in Miami, uh, Payless Shoe Source. Anybody know Payless? <laughs> Payless Shoe Source. Yeah, yeah, so Payless Shoe Source. Ah! I know he's got jokes. You now. were trying shoes on strangers. <laughs> yes, I was. That is amazing for his job. Not only strangers, 87% women. It was a fantastic job. What did you? <laughs> as a young man, as a young man, can I say that? I cannot wait till after this when every woman in here walks up to Fed and goes, what do you think of these? <laughs> How is, how is your job, how is your role at AFT? This is a, a, a big deal job for you, obviously at a, a really important organization. You've seen some major triumphs and some losses. How's it going? It's going fantastic. It's going fantastic. We are in a struggle. We're in a fight. Uh, we are in a time where history will write, what did you do? And I hope that my kids, my grandkids that are to come uh, will say, you know, he fought. He fought hard and he fought for something and he stood up for us. Uh, AFT is one of those places where every day, uh, I, I liken it into the emergency room, right? And it's just like you all know going into your local. Mm -hmm. People know that they need your help. They come in and they're all tired and they're all beat up sometimes, and, but they expect you to do what you do for every patient, every member. Um, just as if you didn't see a, a, a bullet wound the other day, or just as if you didn't see the cuts in the wounds, you have to treat every member the same every time they come in the door. And so that's what we do every day. And so it's a, it's a great opportunity to help people. But well, that should be hard for you. You, you. you treat everybody that way. So whether they're a member or not, you, you always make people feel that way. Uh, it must be hard. Um, how do you keep up with uh, Randy Weingarten energy? energy? You don't. Yeah, you, you don't. don't. <laughs> there is no keeping up. Is she plugged in so, it, it, somewhere right now? Is she charging? She is Amazing. on a bus somewhere yeah. uh, in America. And, you know, to be president of these organizations, uh, you know, all due respect to my friend Becky Pringle and Randy Weingarten and those folks who are leading Andrew Spar, uh, they know uh, to be in the hot seat, uh, as most of these folks are, it's tough. It's a tough job out there. And so I pay uh, homage and respect to anybody who is doing these jobs, including our local presidents. Okay. Uh, Denise came all the way from Minnesota, where she's the president of Education Minnesota. Um, your first job ever. Okay, I've narrowed it down because I really, I'm not going to count babysitting because you don't really get a paycheck. So the first job where I received a big girl paycheck, I was a server at the Pizza Factory in Buffalo, Minnesota. A lot of bragging. It's, it's sexy, it's huge. You remember, you... Yeah. That was, their, that was their tagline, Pizza Factory. <laughs> sexy and huge. Well. <laughs> Come get your hot, giant pizza. I was only a junior in high school, so perhaps that would have been a little inappropriate, but yes. We'll deal with inappropriateness here. We'll keep it, keeps it interesting. You're the president of Education in Minnesota. What is, what is that organization? And you know, most of us, I'll speak, for, I'll speak for most of us, haven't been to Minnesota, <laughs> except for uh, two people. Um, what it, <laughs> tell us about your organization and, and, and yeah. Just. Well, I think um, a lot of you would recognize Education Minnesota because we are one of the five 
merged affiliates and NEA and AFT. So um, <laughs> wonderful to be here with all of you. And uh, we represent um, education support professionals, higher ed faculty, and E12 educators statewide. We are 84,000 members strong. We have 475 locals, and we continue to organize as we speak. All right, thank you very much. Uh, now let's get to Fred. And I said your, one of your early jobs in my intro, I said started his career at United Steelworkers in 1973. That was a career, was that a first job, sir? And thank you so much for joining us here. No, thank you, thank you, glad to be here. You know, when you ask that question, Pete, I started thinking back, and I remember when I was in high school, I got a part-time job after school in a nursing home. And I was a, uh, was a janitor cleaning up rooms. And I'll never forget, it was, a, it was a good and a bad experience because, you know, one of the first things they told me when I started there, you don't give the patients anything unless you're authorized. And this old guy asked me one time, he said, man, I'm tired of this food. Could you bring me some bologna and crackers? <laughs> you know, I went to the store <laughs> during my break, about 25 cents worth of bologna. Becky, you know what that looked like. <laughs> and a nickel pack of crackers. And later on in that evening, this guy was sitting in his wheelchair and he had all these cracker crumbs covered down his front. <laughs> And the manager came in and said, where you get that from? And I'm over in the corner trying to be low kid. He pointed at me. <laughs> Him. Okay. So that was my first experience. Oh, that's getting, great. Getting fired also. <laughs> <laughs> getting fired for doing what you believe in. Right. Helping out a man who just wanted some bologna right. and crackers. <laughs> Uh, tell us about, you know, how important it is that the AFL-CIO is in solidarity with the rest of these organizations. Well, the AFL-CIO, we're a federation of 60 unions uh, throughout the United States. We represent workers in, in every industry uh, throughout this country. Uh, out of our 60 unions, we, have, uh, we represent 12 and a half million members. And it's been, that's right. And you know, the exciting thing about the work that I do is I get to work every day with the first woman to lead the American labor movement and Leah Shuler. And um, I had other plans. <laughs> I wanted to come down here and be on your retiree group, you know. But uh, we had a very sudden death of Rich Trumpka, who was the former president of the AFL-CIO, and uh, a reporter asked me one time, he said, how do it feel to be the highest ranking African-American in history of the AFL-CIO, working with the first woman to lead the movement? And I, you know, I, I thought about that for a minute, and my response was, the thing about the AFL-CIO in that moment was the 60 presidents voted for the two most qualified people to lead the AFL-CIO, yeah. in regardless of their sex or their race. And uh, it's been a privilege. It, it, it's been a privilege to uh, work with unions all over the country, to work with people like Bess Becky, to work with SEIU, to work with the Teamsters, because in this country, we really have a unified labor movement. Awesome, right, that's awesome. Thank you very much for sharing that. And I want, I want crackers. Uh, <laughs> So, Melissa Cropper came all the way from Ohio. You're the president of the Ohio Federation of Teachers. We've heard far too much about your state in the last few weeks. Of course, uh, the vice presidential candidate nominee is the senator from Ohio. You are on the front lines there, obviously, as a teacher. Uh, tell us your first job, a little fun, and then we'll get into your, your work with the organization, uh, Ohio Federation of Teachers. Well, like Denise, my first actual job was babysitting. I had my first babysitting job when I was 11 years old. And I still can't believe someone trusted me with their kids when I was 11 years old. You have five kids and five grandkids, I read. Oh, you know that. Yeah, I mean. And that must be why. I started early watching kids and went on to have five children and five grandchildren and hopefully more grandchildren soon. Um, but my actual real, pay, real first paying job was as a librarian in our public library. And I did that from the time I was a freshman in high school until I was a sophomore in college. Wow, that's very impressive. 
what about your organization uh, and what you, what you guys are doing? And we'll, we'll get into the specifics about the, the fight, but tell us about Ohio. Yeah, so Federation. I apologize for the one senator, but I'm very happy about our other senator, Senator Brown, who we need to reelect this year. Senator Sherrod Brown, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. So Great that's, guy. That's the one we like to talk about. Um, the Ohio Federation of Teachers represents teachers and paraprofessional support staff, some higher ed, but we've been expanding in the past couple years too. We're representing public libraries now. Uh, we have some social workers at Equitas, which is uh, social workers for the LGBTQ plus community. So them and Kaleidoscope who represent teens in the same space. Um, so we've been very excited about the growth that we've been seeing in Ohio. So it's been fun work. Awesome, thank you very much for being here. Uh, and Becky Pringle, uh, the, you, everybody knows a lot about you. Uh, and of course, you're the, now the president of NEA. You were a teacher for a long time, uh, but before that, young Becky Pringle. There she is at her first job. What do you got? So young Becky Pringle wanted to go on the class trip to Spain. And young Becky Pringle's parents said, that's nice. If you can figure out a way to get some money, you, don't go right, you go right on. Um, and I found a job at a mom and pop women's shoe store. I sold women's shoes. Is that how you got involved in this? That's right. <laughs> and I've been all about the shoes ever since. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Oh, my God. Um, uh, that was my first under the table, give you a couple of dollars job. Yeah. Um, uh, my first job that I got a paycheck for was I was a Kelly girl. Do you know what a Kelly girl is? Do they still ex even exist? It, it's, a, it's an agency where they, fi they find workers um, um, to go out and, and work in various companies. And I typed 80 words a minute. Wow. I know. I took my typing class seriously. And so I typed before I became a teacher. Love it. And let's stay with you uh, as we get into the conversation, but just tell us, you know, generally, as I asked Fed, how are things at NEA? What's the momentum? Where is the enthusiasm? What is the fight? So um, uh, NEA, which I trust everyone in this audience can repeat what I'm just I'm about to say, um, is made up of 3 million members, 51 state affiliates, 14,000 locals, which include you. Yeah. We're gonna spend our day talking about power today and we're gonna get into that. Um, but it is with that, with the, with the structure that we have and the amount of people that we have. As you know, we have members in every single congressional district in this country. And so as, uh, the, the, as the moment, as we are looking at meeting this moment, we are focused like a laser on winning all the things. All the things. Winning all the things. Uh, How many? Is, huh? <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> I was just, just going to ask a, a, an ignorant question, which is why? Why does it work? Why is that working? So educators, of course, as you know, are still the most trusted voice in every single community. And what we've been focused on at NEA is making sure that our members, first of all, understand that, and that we train them to use those voices in powerful ways. So when I talk about winning all the things, of course, we're 46 days, three hours, and seconds away uh, from a, a little election here. Um, and so there's a lot of focus, of course, on making sure we elect pro-public education candidates, pro-union candidates, pro-kid candidates, pro-rights candidates, oh my God, pro-women candidates, pro-LGBTQ plus candidates, all the things. 
um, to every office from the school board all the way up to, to the president's office. But I don't just mean that. When I say win all the things, I'm talking about winning for our students. I'm talking about winning for the, for the people who have dedicated their lives to teaching and nurturing and driving and feeding uh, those students. I'm talking about winning for our communities and honestly for this country. And so, the first, so, so NEA is laser focused on the why of winning all the things. And the how is, and I love Andrew, um, power in voice says with the S, there is power in voice, in your voice. And it's important for you to know that, but then when you put them together, when you unify, when you collectively speak and act, that's power. Love it. Uh, I just have to ask everybody just to weigh in um, on how important school boards are. We're here talking to educators and, and talking about what happens in schools, what happens in the classroom, most importantly, what happens for the children in the classroom. But as I talked about last night, I've been in the fight in, in, in my county, in Rockland County, in my town, just north of New York, against what I would call some of the craziest, I don't even say people, but ideas and theories that you've ever heard. And, and they come to the mics and they say the moon is made of cheese and the, and the world is flat, and I don't know how to combat that, and much more divisive, racist, sexist, horrible, horrible things. How much power do these school boards have and how much do you think about uh, the school board fight? Because we're talking mostly about teachers and teachers unions, but it would seem to me that if we don't elect responsible people, often educators on the board, then we're, we're losing and you can't do all the great work that you're doing. So let's start in Minnesota, I think, because I know you guys have a bit of a well, everybody does. What's the, how important are school boards? How is it in Minnesota? Right, it's everywhere. I can tell you that in Minnesota, um, our local unions are leaning into school board races like they never have before. Um, it's amazing. Uh, people kind of throwing out old habits, old traditions, where they would normally sit on the sidelines and just kind of ride it out or wait until they found out who was elected and then try to go in and make relationships. They're just not doing that anymore. They're getting involved because they know if they don't, um, you know, it could be worse. But I think the most um, profound example happened at the end of the last school year where a school board, um, one school board race, it's the most conservative, um, uh, district in the state of Minnesota was won by a Moms for Liberty um, uh, style candidate by less than 20 votes. I mean, it was oh. really, really narrow. Um, and what happened was the school board, which was pretty split, but evenly, they held the school budget hostage. Like they were not going to vote on next year's budget unless there were oppressive policies that wouldn't include all students. Um, you know, it was everything from book banning to making sure that, you know, you can't have um, uh, LGBTQ plus flags out or um, welcoming um, clubs and things like that. They held all of that hostage, uh, they had the, held the budget hostage um, and wanted some of the most oppressive policies. Um, but the community and the union um, stood up. And they said, absolutely not. Um, media got involved and they ended up um, separating it out and passed the budget and did not pass the oppressive oh, policies. Thank God. But, it's, but it's close and, it, and you got to stay close. in it because mm -hmm. they, you know, we won and then we lost. That's right. Uh, what about in Ohio? Uh, are, are, we banning, are we banning books? Are we in the fight? And how bad, how important is the BOE elections? Right. Uh, they're very important, as Denise said. Uh, now, fortunately, Moms for Liberty hasn't been hugely successful in Ohio, but it's a constant battle to keep them out. Uh, to keep some of these crazy ideas out of our schools. I'll just dig into why it's so important. And I'll say th three big reasons. One is because our, school, our students need to be in schools where they feel safe and welcome. And we have people, extremists, get on the boards who are passing um, these wild, putting these wild notions out there. It just makes it an unwelcoming place for our students. Plus, it's feeding into the whole notion of anti-authority and anti-fact, and we can't have that in our schools. Uh, two, we already have a problem with keeping teachers, retaining teachers in the profession. 
So we have school board members who are disrespecting teachers and making an unpleasant place to work. Of course, teachers are going to leave that district and go somewhere else or quit the profession entirely. And third, these school, board, um, school boards can become the breeding grounds for the next an, another office. So we don't want to allow these people to get a foot in the door at the school board level and then go on to run for other offices and get elected. So it's incredibly important that we pay close attention to these school board elections and get the right people on board. Uh, Fed, I, didn't, I don't even think I told you this, but at our, the school that I, my, my daughters uh, attend, Clarkstown, New York, Randy Weingarten is, a, is an alumni. She graduated from there. And so I'm texting her last year. I go, do you know what's happening here? And she, didn't, she wasn't, didn't have her finger on the pulse exactly what's happening in our district. And I told her, and she cut a video, did an interview with her, and so on. But I mean, that, that's the school that she actually graduated from, is the district I'm in. That is, uh, it, these Moms for Liberty, these far-right extremists, the conspiracy theories, the, the overt racism, the anti-science, it isn't party to one part of the country. It's everywhere. How is AFT, how closely are you paying attention to these school board fights? Well, we are absolutely in the fight, but the incubator of all things gone wrong with school boards happened here in Florida. And, you know, we, the, the, the all-out assault and attack started here um, throughout the state, from the Panhandle all the way through the Keys. We have seen uh, a, an unscripted, unparalleled kind of takeover of school boards. The good thing about this year, and I think Andrew mentioned this in his State of the Union, is that this organization is promoting the fight back and teaching the country how to fight back for Moms for Liberty. We beat uh, DeSantis in almost every school board race, well, uh, you know, for the first time in about three or four years. And so this organization, how? Is, well, listen, it, you, I, I mean, you're looking at the army right now. You know, this is, the, these are the folks who really understand the value and the power of school boards because they affect lives every single day. They affect everything that you do as a profession. Uh, they, as a professional, they, uh, they are impacting our students. They're impacting our workloads. They're impacting the working conditions. And so we know uh, the power uh, of these school boards and we know the power that we have to influence these school boards by voting. Uh, Becky, let me just ask you specifically about, I was astonished and, and we all are so uh, outraged by the idea that DEI has been demonized or even ideas like social and emotional learning are demonized um, and, and that they're constantly talking about, you know, they, they, they bring up acronyms that they don't even know what they mean. Get the CRT out of our school. What does that stand for? I don't know. Next person. Um, I, I feel like DEI is one of the most, in, like, we can't run from it. Uh, it means all people, diversity. Equity means access to opportunity. Inclusion means a pathway for all Americans. Why should we be afraid of that? Why should we walk away from that? Um, you know, I wish you all could see Andrew's face. Every time uh, any of us are talking or the question is posed to us, he's just sitting there with his mouth. He's just sitting there smiling like, yeah, yeah, that started here too. Yeah, that here, that, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, uh, uh, and he's right. Um, uh, you have started a lot of things. <laughs> um, uh, but the most important thing you started is that you used your voice to say, of course, we're gonna embrace diversity. That is, that, that is the beauty of our nation. It is the strength of our country. Of course, we're gonna fight for inclusion because we know as educators, we have to see every child, every student for who they are. And we have to make sure we create those just and equitable learning environments for every one of them. Of course, we have to fight for equity. We know that the public education system in this country was never designed to educate people who look like me. And so we have to continue that fight for equity and access, for racial and social justice, so that every student, everyone, can succeed in, a, in an increasingly diverse and very connected, interconnected and global world. 
And so as educators, that is our battle. But there's no question that the fear of talking about talking about these issues is there. And so it's one of the reasons why, so for the NEA, regardless of what is brought up, we know that we have to stay on our journey of racial and social justice. Awareness, building our capacity, our, our racial justice muscle, which, makes, which, which necessarily means we have to start with ourselves and deal with our own internal implicit biases. We have to learn enough to reach out to others and teach. And then we have to always be ready to take action. And that's what our leaders here in Florida have done. They've stood up to book bans. They've stood up to uh, excluding uh, diversity, equity, inclusion. We had a, um, I came down here, I was down here, I've been down here a lot. <laughs> But I wanted, one of the things I wanted to do was hear, just hear from the people here. And so um, Angie helped me put together just a listening session. And so it was students and parents and faith leaders and superintendents, um, uh, par oh, that's the parents, people from the community. And I just asked some questions like that. And I had um, one of the most disheartening um, and emotional stories shared with me by a sophomore at FAMU, Fed, at FAMU. Um, and she said because of what DeSantis was doing and the pressure he was putting on universities, college and university faculty in this state, and the threats that he made to remove their funding, especially when you talk about HBCUs that depend on that funding. She said to me, Becky, our faculty is being threatened that they can no longer teach about slavery in a true and honest way. Mm. I spent my whole life studying and making the choice to go to an HBCU so that I could be taught by black teachers who would engage with me in those conversations. And here I am. They're afraid of losing their job, and the university is afraid of use, losing its funding. And as I listen to all of those voices, it's exactly what we talked about when we're talking about here, how we're going to unite our voices to fight back. And this is something I say to Andrew all the time, and I say to our NEA directors, where are NEA directors? Where you at? Where you at? There's one. Yeah. Yeah. I say to our NEA directors who, who work so hard for you at the national level, it is so important for us to hear your stories and your fight. So whatever we invest in at the NEA, whether it's school board elections or whether it is making sure that you have the training and the resources you need to mount these fights, I need you to do it in a way that you know that you are having impact beyond the borders of the state of Florida. That people are watching you. They're learning from you. They are being motiv motivated by you. And honestly, when folks say Florida now, huge cheers for what you are doing because they see what is possible. Yeah, well, very well said at the end. I was just going to pick up on that because we're in Florida. Your, your point is they see what you're doing in the face of a, a kind of adversity and, and, and obstacles, anti-union state, anti-union governor and legislature. So how does Florida fight back? Fred, you've seen a lot of fights. You've seen a lot of triumphs as an organizer. But it's hard in this state. Harder than other states, I think it's fair to say. Maybe the hardest, one of the hardest. So what do you tell these folks uh, when you're up against legislature and a governor who is constantly trying to pull the rug out from you, constantly trying to make it harder to be in your union, to organize, to bargain, to take your rights? That's a whole different game down here. Well, first of all, this audience, this particular audience, you know, first thing I would like to do is thank this audience for putting up the fight. Yeah. Uh, you know, you have one of the most, and I don't have to tell you, but you have one of the most recalcitrant governors in this country. 
who was really Recalcitrant is nice. Well, that's, I'm trying to be nice. But, you know, look, I mean, the thing that I want this audience to understand is one of the largest consumers of public education is working families, is union members. And, you know, union members are prepared in every industry and in and, and, and every, whether it's public sector union, private sector unions, building trades, you know, is that when it comes to legislation that's going to attack collective bargaining, when it comes to legislation that's going to attack our uh, belief that we have to have a government that, or a system here in Florida that's going to be responsive to the needs of our children. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the fact that we want that history that's important to so many of our students, that's important to all of us, is being suppressed, okay? It's that working families and union members throughout this state is standing with you. And uh, around this country is standing with you. Because, you know, one thing about the labor movement is we talk about power. You know, the thing that unites us all is the fact that every union member in this country have benefited from collective bargaining. Every union member in this country have benefited from fair wages, good benefits, and the right to have a workplace that's going to be free of discrimination. And these are principles of the labor movement that's worth fighting for. So whether you're in public education, you know, whether you're working a public sector job, working for a government or a municipality, you know, the attack on public sector workers is so visible in this country that the labor movement, you know, cannot sit back and be silent. If you're working in a, you know, it, it, it's, it's about, if you're working on a construction site, you're working in a private factory or whatever the case may be, you know, the question is always, once they get them, are we going to be next? You know, so the unity of the labor movement is very, very important in terms of being aware, number one, and being supportive and being active in the fights that you are having here in this state. Uh, you know, look, I mean, the thing about the labor movement is this. Our solidarity means your picket line is my picket line. Your fight is my fight. And there's no place that we can really exhibit that sort of solidarity here in the state of Florida. Well said. Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, let's let's uh, just take a, a departure from the specifics here and share with us, if you, I'm putting you on the spot, should have said this earlier, but uh, a powerful moment, anything in, in, your, in your work or career uh, dealing with a student, dealing with a teacher, uh, overcoming some adversity. I mean, last night we had this, this group of young people here and it was so powerful and I'm still bothered by the fact that I had to follow them. But <laughs> Fed moderated this panel last night and it, it, it's worth, like, if there's a tape, it's worth sharing, it's worth watching. I, the only frustrating part was that it stayed in the walls here of this space because everybody needed to hear it. For me, I, that's my big takeaway, watching those young people. You guys have been in the fight your whole careers. Um, you can point to an example probably pretty quickly, or many, we could talk about them for a long time. What's something, a, a powerful moment in, in your life and career? So, so I'd I, I like to pivot your question r r really quick and just talk about the here and now. Sure. Uh, because there are some people here, this is the choir, right? But there's somebody in this audience where their rent is behind. There's somebody in this audience right now who is gonna go home and doesn't know how they're gonna pay the next mortgage bill. There is somebody in this audience who has an aging parent and they don't really know how to deal with that mm. uh, when they go back home, right. right? There's somebody in this audience who is thinking about retirement but knows that they have 10 years between 55 and 65, they don't know how to pay insurance. There's somebody in here who the mortgage that they've been paying and they've been doing everything that this country asked them to do and their insurance went up 200%, 200%. Those are the issues that our superheroes are dealing with every day. That's the here and now. 
And when people tell me I'm going to vote for this person, I'm going to vote for that person, I said, look at your kitchen table issues. Look at what's going on in your home. Look at what you care about. Look at the kid next door. Look at the, the, your neighbor next door. We are doing everything that society asks us to do. Do right. Have good morals, good characters. Go to school if you can. Come back, get a job. You know you won't get rich. But you're giving back to this society of ours, this great society of ours. And society gives you back what? A kick in the butt. Because of politics, because of power that people are assuming for the lesser good and not the greater good. And so we've got to figure out how to harness that power. We can't let our problems and our obstacles and our challenges get us down. We've got to figure out how we get together. See, unions have always found themselves better in the worst of times. People who care about water and beaches and environment, we, we're watching beach erosion every day and nobody's saying that we have a climate problem here. We're watching kids just, you know, run them up. We're watching our seniors and our elders split pills, can't pay for pharmaceuticals in this state. And then there are, are people in power who are saying, oh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm doing everything right. No, you're not. No, you're not. And so how to harness that power, that's why I think it's so powerful that Andrew used this harnessing power. How to overcome, how to push, how to persevere, and how to do those things. And so I know we're going to talk about all of those experiences that we've had, but you've got to figure out how you harness that power, how you push that power, how you do what physics tells us, right? Energy over time equals power. Mm. How do you put that together, together as, as a human being, as a person, multiply that, and then push it in an effort so that we can go forward? That's really what I need, needed you all yeah, to yeah, hear that's about. A much better question and answer. Well, let me just stay with that then, you know, and, and talk more generally then about triumphs and losses. You know, it's easy to quit. It's easy to quit when we lose, but then you're never going to come back. You're never going to win. So w talk to me about Minnesota, Denise, and, you know, again, similar questions. Anything that's motivated you or inspired you, but, you know, similar to what Fed said, what do you do when you've lost and how do you come back? and how important is, as he said, harnessing power? Yeah, I, it's such a good question. And um, I, right away I thought about when Education Minnesota elected Tim Walls to be our governor. Um, to me that was, you know, there was a highly contested election. Um, there were a lot of people that were running for in the primary um, got narrowed down to two and then um, to, to Governor Walls. But for us to lean in every way we could to elect a teacher to be in that position meant everything. It meant everything um, because he was one of us. You could see yourself in Governor Walls when he was running. You could see yourself in every story he shared about being in the classroom, about what it's like to work at our work sites. Um, you knew he was just an average person. Didn't have rich friends, but he had 80,000 educators that were willing to pool their $25 a piece to make a big um, impact in, in that election. And we voted. That was the key. Not only did we show up um, with our pocketbooks, which aren't deep and we're not rich, um, but we showed up to vote to elect one of us. And he won. But I think what ends up happening, and so, you know, we, like Becky, we're going to win all the things. We're going to work hard and we're going to do everything we can. But we have to also remember that when we um, organize and act collectively, we get a lot of wins. But we also have to be ready for what happens when we lose. And I think that that's one of the important learnings and one of the things that I'm taking away from my leadership at Education Minnesota is we don't do enough and we don't um, support our locals to be ready for what happens when you lose, when you fall flat on your face, when you right. um, get smacked down. How do you get back up? And how do you, you know, kind of dust yourselves off and say, we're going to try this again? Or what did we learn for, from, from this? Um, far too often I see people saying, well, hey, I saw, I saw Education Minnesota, or I saw my local, and 
they went after this and they failed and what are they doing for me? And they walk away. We can't have that. So I think it's just as important, if not more, to talk about what we're going to do when we get smacked down. Awesome, Denise. Uh, Melissa, what about in Ohio? Um, same question. You know, Ohio is a really complex state. Um, you know, we elected Barack Obama and then turn around several years later and Trump wins by 20 points in Ohio. And in those intervening years, we lost and lost and lost and lost. And it gets really difficult. It gets really discouraging to, uh, during election cycle to try to get people to turn out when you feel defeated. Because you know, like our last, you know, when, before Governor DeWine got elected, he ran against Rich Cordray. We thought Cordray was going to win that election and ended up losing. And it's just this deflating feeling that happens. But we still have to keep motivating people to work. And last year, we had this huge turnaround. Um, I think I tell people all the time, Ohio is just a vote away from being one of the most extreme states in this union. Mm -hmm. But they fly under the radar because we're not seeing necessarily the outrageous headlines like we see in Florida or Texas or other places. But we've got these legislators who are working on structural things to change us structurally. We're one of the most gerrymandered states right. in the union. And so they change us structurally so it makes it harder for us to win battles going forward. Last year, in April of last year, our legislature passed a law that said that uh, they were banning August elections. Couldn't have any more August special elections. Two weeks later, they voted to have an August special election to change how we do gerrymandering or how we do ballot initiatives in the state from a simple majority to a 60% threshold. Passed that in May. The election was in August. We rallied the truce like we've never rallied the truce before, and we defeated that initiative. That's great. They, they were doing that because they knew women's reproductive health was going to be on the ballot in November. So they were trying to raise the thresholds because so they thought that we wouldn't be able to, to uh, pass our women's reproductive rights. We passed women's reproductive rights in November. And so that has helped create some momentum that I hope is going to go forward in this election. So I, I've, every morning now when I go into work, I've been listening to the, the song from Suffs, Keep Marching. And it starts out by saying, you know, we may not live to see the future that we fight for. Maybe no one gets to see that perfect day. If the work is never over, how do we keep fighting anyway? But that's the thing, we do have to keep fighting. And, and the way I look at it is, there's not a person in this room who wouldn't do the best they can do to negotiate a contract. No matter how tired they are, they're gonna negotiate a contract or handle a grievance or organize, you go out and organize, I mean, you guys have been organizing like crazy, and you could spend, no matter how tired you are, you go out and have those conversations. We have to treat our election cycle the same way. It's the biggest organizing campaign we've ever worked in. It's the biggest negotiation, it's the biggest grievance we've ever had to handle. And we have to keep, wake up and do it every day. And instead of thinking about how tired it makes us, we have to think about how damn good it feels when we win. Oh, I like that, yeah. I like that. I also like that we got when we wrap it up, maybe we can play that song, Suffs, Keep Marching. That's a concrete example of, of something to motivate us. Fred, have you ever spent months or years on a campaign or anything else and lost? Oh, yeah. I've, I've uh, lost many of organizing campaigns and have won many, too. But, uh, you know, the, the, the thing that keeps me motivated is when I uh, go down to Macon, Georgia, to an organizing drive that my union, the steel workers, was running with a company to make electric buses. Hmm. And I talked to these workers. And these workers who, a uh, half a dozen, uh, six or seven of them have been fired for starting the organizing campaign. And to watch those workers get behind the principle of collective bargaining. Hmm. I should be able to work one job instead of three to take care of my family. And the way that those workers rally around those fired workers to help sustain them until they won this fight. And then you go to Birmingham, Alabama, where we have Starbucks workers that's working on their fourth campaign because they refuse to give up. You know, and these are the things that motivate me. Went to a call center in Jackson, Mississippi, being organized by, that was organized by CWA. And during that organizing campaign, and majority of these workers are black women, 
I met some women who were sleeping in a van after working 12 hours because they could not afford rent and they slept in a van to wait until the next shift and this company was, was getting government contracts to call people about the Medicare, you know, and I mean, but to watch the will and the strength of these workers who are only asking to be treated with dignity and self-respect, the opportunity to collective bargain, the opportunity to have a voice in the workplace, that's what gives me strength. And there's no losing when you have that sort of determination and that sort of solidarity, whereas if we lose today, we're coming back tomorrow. Because the integrity of work and the, the, the ability of workers, most of my young workers who are standing up and saying, enough is enough. You know, and when you have that sort of energy that's running throughout this country today, where workers are realizing that the best way, the good wages, the good benefits, the safety and health is through the union movement. That should motivate all of us when we look at our individual situations to know that there's people out there that's fighting to become one of us. And that's what keeps me going. I love it. I I just, I, this panel is, <laughs> is so uh, effective, obviously, as communicators. I'm sorry, we'll just wait till that phone stops ringing. <laughs> that you, uh, you, your gravitas is so, impre I feel like I just want to hear you tell me how to make a sandwich, and I would still be like, oh, wow. <laughs> Bologna and crackers, specifically. Uh, Becky, I, I mean, I, I want to move on, but you got to answer this question too. You must have uh, and plenty of experiences of adversity, of, of specifically of losing after working really hard on an initiative, a campaign. Any advice? Um, uh, yes, and I want to kind of try to tie uh, the question you asked Fed and how he answered it, and the rest of the comments that that folks have made. In his very last speech, Dr. King described power as the ability to achieve purpose and affect change. And I want to tie my, my, com the, my comments into all of the comments that were made, because in all of them, throughout this panel, you could hear these leaders talk about their why. As you were asking the question, our why? Why, yeah. why, why, why did we get into education? Why did we become activists in our unions? Why did we raise our hands or get voluntold and still do it? Um, and it ties, that why will always tie into what you do when you win. Because Denise, you're right, you have to be prepared for when you lose. And you also have to be prepared for when you win. Because hmm. too many times we've won and we had a party. Yay, we won! We're done! You're not done. <laughs> you're not done. <laughs> because those people who you elected have to know you are there, you are the wind behind them, you're gonna hold them responsible for what they said, but you're also gonna make sure that you surround them. So the school board member that was elected and took her oath of office on a stacked band of books, she won because she, her message was that we are not banning books in 2024. But she has to know that the people who elected her are there with her when she fights to change that policy so that she can be there the next time. Not just that. We have to be prepared for when we win because we are the ones who should be writing, creating, and then passing policies that make a difference for our students and for educators and for working families all around this country. So we have to be prepared for when we win. When we don't win, that's why 
what I see here in Florida, FEA, you are such a model of both of those things that I just said. And the important part of, of picking your head up when you lose is being able to look up and see pockets of wins. Because even as you were losing, and I'll put quotes around that even though you literally were losing, you were building power. And I know of the locals in this state who were winning school board elections in the middle of that losing. You were winning. Mm. And others were seeing that win. And so we have to, we also have to be intentional about telling those stories of winning so that people know, uh, like I said, not only what's possible, but they understand uh, the strategies and the steps you took. Won't always be the same, but you need to know what is possible. And then the last thing I'll say is, is this. We're not, NEA is not part of AFL. But somebody said this earlier, you know, this is that moment. This is that moment where everybody's fight is our fight. When you feel the power of all of these unions coming together and fighting for each other, what the way Fred, uh, Fred just described, why it's important for private sector unions to care about education, that's important. Those are the stories we need to continue to tell. And so even in the midst of losing, there's winning going on, and we need to tap into that, get a sense of possibility and pride and power and be part of the larger movement that is winning, because we are winning. That larger movement is winning. We have never had the kind of interest in unionizing, of growing our density in, within our union, of recertifications, certainly here in Florida, 15 out of 15, is that right? Is that right, Andrew? Oh my gosh, that's happening all over the country. That kind of winning. And so we have to get our energy and be able to pick our heads up by knowing that we are building a powerful union movement, which, by the way, our youngest generation, our youngest generation, has the highest belief in the power and the purpose of unions. Mm. Well, that's a good answer. Um, let me just stay with you and then go to everybody and let's um, uh, try to keep these a little bit more brief because I've got a whole bunch of questions coming in from members in the audience to my phone. That's what I'm looking at, by the way, if you see me. I'm not not paying attention to Becky Pringle. Um, so I've got questions coming in from you and also we'll, we'll um, open the mics here in a minute if you want to walk up to the mics. For, uh, they're here and here. Is that right? Four and six, number four and six. But this one is not an easy one, but again, if we can keep it somewhat brief and staying with you, Becky, first, Casey from Gilchrist, Gilchrist County says, what is the number one thing a member can do to make a difference? And I want you all to answer this one. Number one thing a member can do to make a difference. The number one thing a member can do to make a difference is to recruit, engage, retain, and mobilize those who are closest to them. It is when you connect one-on-one, -on -one, it's organizing one-on-one. -on -one. When you tell your story and listen to others, you find, find out where their passion is, you meet them where they are. If they are members, you identify what it is in the union that they can do. If they are not members, you identify those issues that are most important to them, as Fed laid out, and you talk about what the union is doing and what they can do to help build power in that union. The number one thing for you to do as a member is to know that you are FEA. You are NEA, you are AFT, you are AFL, you need to know your power. Well, that's a, a, a great, amazing answer and may have uh, stolen it from the rest of you to some extent. So yeah, if, but, but what would you say just to build on it? Like, how do you recruit? Like, if that's, if that's the best answer, the best thing you can do, Casey asks, what is the number one thing a member can do to uh, make a difference? Adding to Becky. Uh, 
what it is to be engaged and understand that the union isn't something that's out there. You are the union. So to make sure that people understand that every single person is a union, it's not some outside entity. So to tell people that and to talk about your personal experience in the union. Fred? I would just say, say a good word about your union. You know, to your neighbors, to your children, uh, at your church. And, you know, we have to be the messengers to really talk to people about the good work that the union movement is doing. And I think every member could, you know, if every member did that, okay, then I think that, um, you know, we'll be more powerful than we currently are. Denise? I don't think I can say it any better than the first three. Just do something, be part of the work. Uh, people say that like uh, uh, hashtag activism is, is not great. I actually think it's great. It, it, everybody's got a platform, you got 10 friends, if, if to, to, to finish it up, to wrap it up, Fed, number one thing a, a member can do, and if it is, to recruit, to maintain, how do you do it? Uh, tell your story. It's the most powerful thing that you have. That is the most powerful thing you have. Tell them why you're a part of the union. And if they're friends with you, they, they believe in you. That's the first, there's this first friend, best friend. Tell your story, right? I'm the kid who, who society says I wasn't supposed to be here. Teachers saved my life. Um, I, you know, I, when I was a young teacher, it was the mature teachers who were in the union who saved me as a young educator. And, you know, through this thing, when I had a bad principal, it was a teacher who counseled me. That's my story. Tell them your story. If you tell them your story, they believe that because that's truth and honesty and transparency coming from you. It is the, always the most powerful message and language and speech you will ever make. Talk about you and the why, the why in the you. Not just you, but talk about the why you are here, why you do the work. It's the most powerful thing that you have. Uh, personal, uh, personal privilege, just to add to that, you made me think, what if someone here has never told their story? You've never written your story, even in your journal. So I was just going to add, it, it, tell your story, but maybe you've never told it. Maybe you've never written it. Maybe now is the time. Write it and share it and tell your story. I absolutely love that. All right, let's go to these mics. Uh, now, over there, I think you were first. Just, and, and again, I'm a professional moderator. Uh, keep it tight. Make it a question. Don't be a jerk. Nobody's going to be, I'm sure. But uh, go, your name, where you're from, and your question, right? Yep. Is this, oh yeah. You're on. Yes, okay, so I am Alex Scott. I'm from Talc right here. Um, that's in Lee County, if you don't know. And uh, I am trying to um, get FEA to, to uh, move us all to Tallahassee at one time. And I'm trying to figure out a date that you guys would think would be best to do that. Done it before, right? Yep. Okay, I, 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 do, you want, <laughs> do you want to answer that? All right, that's the suggestion. You're, that's a suggestion that you have, how to get to everybody to the Capitol. Well, uh, less that and more, um, I need a date that uh, we could all r work around. He's going to get back to you, I think. He's going to talk to you, right? Yeah? Awesome. Great suggestion, great idea. Um, and I think that's best handled by FEA. I, I don't know if anybody wants, I mean, we've, we've seen, this I is effective. Want, okay. I what, Minnesota? <laughs> um, great, thank you. You're on it, you'll get an answer. Uh, who is next? We'll go here. Yep. Uh, Don Pearson, uh, Palm Beach County CTA, speaking as an individual. Uh, and you touched a lot on what I was gonna say. I'm a coach and a teacher 43 years. I'm in my 43rd year. But as a Thank coach, you. it is great to be positive and say, hey, we're winning. But when I coach wrestling and I say we're winning, they say, honestly, coach, we're in last place. Hmm. What are you going to do? We're winning, but we in Florida are in last place on salary. What are you going to do? Great, great question. Anybody want to take that? So as the song says, keep marching, keep marching on. Uh, I, I firmly believe that most people don't understand how powerful we actually are when we combine together. So I think it is believing and connecting. I mean, it's, that word collective is so important and just keep building that collective power and keep telling the stories to bring people together. And you do just have to keep fighting and keep fighting and keep fighting, you know, as a coach, but the, the more you come together and work together, 
the more powerful you're going to be and the better results you're going to have than trying to do things local by local or individual by individual. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, real quick, Ohio, the reason, in 2022-23, my brother teaches in Ohio. And at that point, I believe Ohio was like 19th. So as brothers, he goes, ah, we're whooping your butt. We're 19 and you're 48 then. So I want to I want to whoop his butt. Sorry. Well, how about that? You know what you should tell you should tell your brother be like hey, I know I a wrestling coach in Ohio. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jim Jordan. Yes. Anyway. Uh, Thank you. Stop bringing up our embarrassing Ohio's. We have some good I'm ones. sorry. I'm sorry. Just... <laughs> Sherrod Brown. Sherrod Brown. Tell them about Sherrod Brown. Brown. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I uh, I just wanted to add to that. You know, I I I coached cheerleading. And one of the things that I did when my, my uh, squad was not winning, the, as I started with assessment, as educators, we know that. Okay, what, are, what, what do we need? What are, what are our gaps? What do we need? Um, and where are we gonna get our resources to fill those gaps? And so, and for, those, for those of you are, who are in places where the, win, the losing continues, you need to start there. What we have certainly tried to express to you is that you're not alone. Mm. You're not alone. And you have resources to begin to build and to, to bridge those gaps that will ultimately lead to the winning. I feel like that's personified by the fact that you all came here to tell these people that they're not alone. From Ohio, from Minnesota, obviously Fred. So, you know, I mean, uh, I think that's, uh, that's why you're all here, to remind everybody here that you're not alone. Uh, I think we got another question at the mic. Name, where do you work? And uh, briefly, your question, if you can, man. All right. Uh, Ryan Scalmont from Osceola, CA, speaking as an individual. Um, as a proud son, of a Haitian immigrant, how can we, as educators, address the harmful language regarding immigrant communities, such as the recent comment made by our former president about a Haitian immigrant in the context of promoting social justice and emphasizing the importance of voting in the upcoming presidential race? It's a great question. It's a big issue, immigration and, you know, People coming from all over in our public schools, I'm seeing it already. People are, get all uh, uh, worried about the, the new people and very good questions. So what about in, in, when it comes to education, immigration, how we're dealing with that? Anybody want to take that? Want me to start? Sure. Okay, I'll start. So, so, so first of all, I'm, I'm from Miami, uh, probably one of the largest uh, Haitian American populations in our country. And so uh, immigrants should, stand proud of where they're from and where they are. Um, in the face of lies, in the face of hate, in the face of divisiveness, in the face of just blatant dishonesty, blatant untruth, we have to be the truth tellers. We have to be the vanguards of all things that are right. Uh, there have been some things that have been said about people, Haitians specifically, uh, you know, recently from the loudest uh, of, of megaphones that you can possibly have. And we, as teachers, have to teach the truth. We have to say the truth. The truth matters. And those empathy points in America matter. This is by, for, and about the people, all the people. And so we should be proud of who we are. We are a land of immigrants. We are people who have built this country uh, over and over and over again. No matter what ship you came over here from, you, we are all in the same boat now. And so people don't really uh, understand. And, and for my Haitian uh, uh, immigrants specifically, you are the sons and daughters of Toussaint L'Ouverture. You uh, are the, 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 the battle warriors that show the West how to fight. And so we know that truth and honesty in history and in civics and engagement. And we know that people are blatantly trying to divide us as a country. So I will tell you, you know, disregard a lot of that. Fight it back with, with, with truth and honesty and empathy and love. Because justice is love in real time. Mm. Mm. I don't know how you add to that, but it's such a it's such a such a big issue. And also, we just have to come around these communities and do everything we can in those local communities, find those families, and let them know, welcome, welcome to our town. I'd love to eat whatever you're cooking. 
And, and I'll just add uh, that uh, great answer. I can't add to that answer other than to say the people of Springfield um, really, I mean, the, the story before the, the story was that they're very accepted in the community. Uh, the, the business workers were, the business owners were uh, embracing having quality workers come in. The problem, but the governor was going in prior to Trump being there and bringing together all the government agencies and just saying, you know, how do we deal with some language barriers? How do we deal with the lack of resources in the area? And I'm not a huge Governor DeWine fan usually, but uh, he really was doing a good job in that community until outsiders stepped in and made up a story yeah. that called a lot of division and is bringing a lot of hatred into the community now. So the best thing we can do for the Springfield community is to let them know that we support the positive work that we're tr they're trying to do. We are vehemently opposed to all the divisiveness that's happening. And then step back and let the community and the governor and the state do what they need to do to help the community grow and thrive and keep the politics out of it. Great, great, great answers. Um, okay, we'll go back to the, thank you very, that's an awesome question. I'm glad you brought that uh, very important issue up. Let's come back, I think over here, you were next. Yes, hi everybody. My name is Kalina Armstrong Henry. I'm with the um, United Faculty of Florida, Broward College. I'm from a first time delegate. And I want, <laughs> and I want to say thank you everybody up here. Our, funny moderator, but thank you everybody up here. You spoke most eloquently, passionately, um, and it makes me enheartened. Um, thank you. But I want to say, Becky, I have a question for you. Did you go to Spain? I did! <laughs> okay. I Kudos. Did. <laughs> All your hard work paid off and it's keep paying off, but thank you everybody. Thank you. Did you work while you were there? I did not. The what? <laughs> Amazing. Um, all right, I think we just have time for, for one more question. I'm sorry. Um, um, who has the best one? Who has the better question? <laughs> Fight it out. You think it's you? Do you think it's you? You think it's her? We're, you're, you're going once, it's twice? me, me. Oh. Let's do both. We'll do both. Whoever talks first wins. Go quickly. Go. Me, I'm, me, me. No, I won't have it. I started I'm, that. I was the, you go, go ahead, quick, quick, quick. And then Ward. you, and then you. Okay, I'm go quick. I'm Carmen Ward. I am originally from Ohio, so I welcome my Ohio sister. And I always recruit people by telling them, my teachers taught me that the union saved this country. And we were 100% in Ohio. All the teachers were in the union, right? So um, that's part of my recruiting story. But my question is, what do we do with propaganda? What do we do with the people that just keep telling us lies over and over? I'm a leader. I'm in the executive cabinet for FEA. I'm a local president. But how, what are some strategies you use to combat the nonsense, the blatant lying over and over that we confront as leaders. There's litter boxes in the classrooms. <laughs> it's, uh, what do you say? It's a, great it's a great question. How do you react to nonsense that a lie that flies so fast around before the truth has time to get a choose on? How do you, how do you combat the propaganda nonsense? Well, I think you have to actually do an assessment of what kind of propaganda it is. How deep is it? Um, are, is it a small group, a large group? So depending on your community, you know, see if you can figure out how bad is it. Um, I think one of the things that I always practice is to not continue to pass on the propaganda. Um, the more you repeat it, the more you share it. Um, you know, it just gets out there over and over again. And at the same time, Tell that truth. Share your values. Tell what's going on, what's really going on um, at the workplace or in your schools. I think that we can't get pork continued gasoline on the propaganda. We can't give it airtime. But at the same time, if it's bad, if it's deep, we absolutely have to push back and tell the truth. Awesome. Can, can Great I, question. I, yep. really quick? I, yep. I just want to tell Carmen really quick. Ha have a unified message. Have a unified message and continue to magnify the truth. Right. You, you make sure that you stand on your truth. I, you know, I, I know what Becky's going to say 
because she has a unified message. We're going to win all the things, right? We're going to win all the things. Have a message that your members at school sites know, that your, your reps know, and that you can use that over and over again because that becomes the truth, because it is the truth. Stand on your values. Never get caught up in the propaganda of it, right? You have to kind of dismiss some of it, but then you have to address it where you need to. But then what is your message? And then how do you magnify that message? And then what vehicle are you using to actually magnify magnify that message. These propagandists have, 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 have become experts in the field of lies and dishonesty and truth, but we have to become messengers of what is the truth too. So there's a strategy to that, right? You have an infrastructure, a building rep structure that can magnify the truth over and over, and then they have to be strong enough, they have to have enough power to say and stand against the lies at their school site. So that means trust and honesty and transparency at the work site, right? No matter how good or how bad it is, and sometimes the truth hurts, but you gotta tell it. Mm. And sometimes the truth is not what people wanna hear, but you gotta tell it. And sometimes the truth is not we're going to get the greatest contract we've ever seen, but you got to tell the truth. And so, and, and that truth will pierce through. People always win. Good people always win. Good messaging always wins. But it's hard and it's tough and you get beat up at the same time, but you got to keep going. And you know it because you're a good leader over there in Gainesville. And thank you for what you've been doing for a long time. Great question. All right, final question quickly and, and then we'll wrap it up. Okay, good morning. Marion Phillips, I'm president of the Nassau Educational Support Personnel Association up in Fernandina Beach, Florida. Becky, I hope you get to yeah. come soon. Um, I'm also a vice president for the Florida AFL-CIO and an NEA Leaders for Tomorrow graduate class of 210. So I have been involved in all of the union and soon to be an NEA board of director, I think, from what I'm hearing. But anyway, my question is, you know, we have this problem with e-dudes. And as the president, I call the people who haven't written their check because some of us write checks. So the other day, a union member who's a maintenance worker for like 20 years, I called and said, hey, if you want to come by the office, write your check, I'll mail it in for you. He said, I'm not going to belong to any organization that supports Kamala Harris, blah, blah, blah. And I thought he was lying to me. I thought he was joking. And so we got in a little tiff about it. And the next day I called him and I said, look, I don't like the way you talk to me. I said, what is your problem? He said, I'm not going to vote for anybody that supports Kamala Harris. And I said, why are you doing this? The union is getting, we just got you 50 cent. We just got a $5 million package. I'm sorry, I'm not going to stay a member. What would you tell these people? Because I am a very strong person. I'm like, bring in the baseball bats. Let's go after these people. I'm tired of it. Somebody come get DeSantis, take him somewhere and put him on an island and leave us alone. I mean, that's how I'm at this point. But what? I'm so, fed up. That's a fair, it's, it's a, it, the question is, what do you, what do you Yeah, that's say? my yeah. question, but I'm okay. fed up. All right. Yeah. Ooh, I'm a Philly girl, so I get what you mean. Um, uh, but I want to say this, I want to answer your question as I wrap it into what was said before. It is so important that whatever, when, when you are talking with members, non-members, community, that you ground yourself in your, in your vision of what you want. And you're not going to be able to answer every question, but you always have to ground it back there. And you certainly, in that response, started to do that. When we talk about our vision to promote and protect and strengthen public education, we, as educators, as unionists, don't have to be the only ones telling that story. And you heard it a little as we talked, but I want to, make, I want to be more explicit. One of the things that Andrew did for this convention, <clears throat> excuse me, is invited um, uh, one of the, the uh, heads, the leaders of, of parent organizations here in Florida. Because you understand that this is not a battle you can fight by yourself. You have to build a movement beyond us. And so it's not only about recruiting and retaining and engaging and mobilizing members, or even non-members, it's also about doing those things with our allies. 
Because if we are going to be successful and we're going to be able to sustain that success, you've got to think about it as building that broader movement. That also is at the core of building power, that you understand that before you're ready to, part of being action ready or strike ready, ready to take action to recruit a member, is making sure that you have united your community behind going for that large contract, behind fighting against uh, uh, any effort to, uh, to, re to in any way take the truth out of teaching uh, this nation's history to do everything to stand up for LGBTQ rights and women's rights in the moment as educators. And so it is absolutely essential that you ground everything, even the responses to the hate and the lies. It's got to be grounded in your own vision. And then never miss that opportunity to speak your truth, mm. to tell your story, and to be proud of who you are. Be proud of who you are. You are FEA. You stand up for our students. You are the ones who are the voice of our communities. You are the ones that will save this state. You are the ones that will push this country to live up to the poetry of its constitution. Whoa. We the people, we the people, we the people, all of us deserve that right to be truly free. Don't ever forget your purpose. Uh, we're not gonna be able to follow that. Final co comments or words to, to this group. Um, I just want to say thank you so much all for being here, for coming down here. Uh, but what would you say uh, in parting uh, to these amazing union members? Well, first of all, I just want to say um, I'm definitely, being in this room with all these teachers, I'm definitely leaving here smarter than I was when I came <laughs> in. But look, uh, the, labor, the, the entire labor movement is indebted to you because you're working within a system where you have legislators who don't love our children as much as you do. Uh, your work is valued, your work is needed, and you know, we stand behind you. You know, this is a tough fight, but together we can win this fight. So hang in there, thank you for what you do, and let's move this to victory. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Anybody else want to say anything? Yeah. Okay. Um, I just want to say, um, again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Andrew, for the invitation. And to thank all of you for inspiring a nation. You really, really do. Um, and for um, leaning into um, your own power. Um, I started teaching in 1989, and it, talking about educator power was not a good thing. Mm. If you were not student-centered and talking about the kids, then you were selfish and you shouldn't be here. Quit talking about what you need. And what I love right now in the moment that we're in is educators are standing up and talking about their needs, their working conditions, what it is that they need at home. Because if the educators aren't taken care of, we cannot be the best that we can be for our students. So thank you for taking on that power. It is not a bad thing. It's something to be proud of. Um, and I'm proud of you for doing it. Thank you, Denise. That was great. Yeah. Can, can I just say, our, our best days are ahead. Our brighter days are coming. Uh, this is the state of Florida. I believe in this state. I'm a third generation Floridian. I believe in the power of what we can be. I believe in the power of what we hope for. I believe in opportunity. And I believe at the very base of that opportunity is public education, is teachers, is paraprofessionals, is secretaries, is security monitors. It's, it's all of those people who make up this educational village because we know that education has inspired us all. We sit here because of a teacher. We sit here because a bus driver you know, got us from one point to another. We sit here because a paraprofessional gave us five more minutes. We sit here because the lunch lady slipped us a cookie. Hmm. We understand the power 
of public education on all levels. We sit here because a counselor stopped one of us from committing suicide one day. And so if you believe in that and you believe that it is better for our children and our grandchildren, then stay in the fight, hang in there, do what you need to do to show up. And you know, when, when, when you feel like you've reached the end of your rope, just tie a knot and just hold on because help is coming. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the ones for this fight. We are the ones that are built for this moment. We are the gonna change this state. And then when history looks back at us for 40 years from now, we're going to say, God damn it, I was there. I was there. Yep. I was there. And here's what I did. Here's what I did. And let's put the stake in the ground and let's draw the line in the sand and say no more. Because sometimes you can overreach and sometimes you can have too big a government. And sometimes you can have people in these ideologues who want to do anything and everything that they want to do. But we've got to stop this. We've got to cut the line off and we've got to say not here, not now, not on our watch. And so FEA, that's power. Harness that power like Andrew's trying to get you to do, like Carol's trying to get you to do, like Nadi's trying to get you to do. Harness that power. Don't be afraid when you go back to school. Don't be afraid when you go back to these school districts. Don't be afraid when the superintendent says, hey, you are going to be the problem. No, don't be afraid. You stand up to that. You stand up to that because that's what we need. We need leaders. We need people who are going to speak truth to power. And you stand up when you get back. Do not be afraid of these people. They are people just like you. They put on one pants leg at a time. And so we want to make sure that we are fighting that fight and FEA is in the center of that fight. And so thank you all very yeah, much. Yeah, thank you.